Good afternoon. I am Ann Jennings. I have the honor as serving as the Secretary of Natural and Historic Resources for Governor Northam and the privilege to introduce the governor to gavel in this meeting of the Chesapeake Executive Council. Governor Northam's life has been one of service to others. Governor Northam served eight years in active duty in the United States Army, treating soldiers wounded in Operation Desert Storm. He practiced pediatric neurology at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughter. And for 18 years, he volunteered as the medical director for the Edmark Hospice for Children in Portsmouth, actually the first hospice in the nation designed specifically for children. The governor served seven years in Virginia's Senate and then served as Virginia's Lieutenant Governor. Governor Northam made very clear at the beginning of his term that restoring the Chesapeake Bay would be a top tier priority for his administration. And he has very much delivered on that commitment. While guiding us through a global pandemic, uh, closing out our fiscal year 2021, which was the pandemic year, uh, with a record surplus, an historic record surplus. Getting Virginia named uh, the best state for business three times running, bringing in $80 billion of economic investment and creating 100,000 jobs. I believe Governor Northam's administration is proof positive of that often repeated quote that a healthy environment and a robust economy are opposite sides of the same coin. So I ask you all to please join me in welcoming the 73rd Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Ralph S. Northam. Well, thank you, Ann, Secretary Jennings, for your, your kind introduction, and, and more importantly, thanks for your leadership. I, I uh, tell folks all the time that um, I go around and make announcements and cut ribbons, but I, I know who really does the work behind the scenes, and certainly that's our, our staff, our administration, and certainly our secretary. So our Secretary of Natural Resources, you've done a, a wonderful job, so, so thank you. And welcome to all of you. Happy holidays. I know it is a very busy time of the year, but really appreciate all of you joining us today. Some of you making rather long trips. We just had a, I think a very good and productive lunch. Uh, we heard from the uh, commissions, had some great recommendations. And I, I just wanted to start my comments by uh, acknowledging the relationships that I have made uh, over the last uh, 14 plus years in, in this business. But uh, one of them, and he couldn't be with us today, is is my friend from Maryland, Governor Hogan. And I just wanted to have folks, if, if he's not able to see this, but remind him that uh, we had some delicious crab cakes for lunch uh, and to make sure he understands uh, that those crabs all start uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, and, and as he says, uh, when they get larger, they get smarter and they migrate up to uh, Maryland, but I, I told him, I said, what happens really is they get older and get demented and go up to, to Maryland. But, but anyway, please uh, pass our regards on to Governor Hogan. Mayor Bowser has been a, a great partner as well in, in all of the surrounding states. So thanks to, to all of you. Our, our local government citizen and, and science advisors offered their guidance to the council as we just had lunch. And I want to especially thank the volunteer members of the three advisory committees for their continued service and commitment to this regional partnership. I had the opportunity to, to meet with them twice during my time as chair of the executive council. It is important that the council work with these volunteer advisors to make sure we take actions that are based on sound science, respond to citizen concerns and respect the critical role local governments play in restoring the bay. Over lunch, we discussed our progress in achieving our restoration goals. And you'll hear more about that shortly. Together, we are making progress on many fronts. We are improving the water quality, protecting sensitive lands and increasing public access. But we must continue 
to hold frank and transparent discussions about where we are falling short. And importantly, we must also commit to taking action where necessary to get us back on track. When we last met at the Brock Center in Virginia Beach, we signed the Collective Action for Climate Change Directive. We made clear that climate change presents a severe threat to the work of restoring the Chesapeake Bay, and we directed the Chesapeake Bay program to build climate science into all of our clean water actions. The work of this partnership is very personal to me and to my wife, Pam. Uh, I grew up on the Eastern shore of Virginia, a place whose culture and character has been shaped by water. Water is all around us there. My childhood memories are filled with the wonders and joys of exploring the creeks and marshes around our home. I spent hours crabbing and fishing on the bay. It was always, my parents would always encourage me to get out of the house, do something else. And in my college years, I actually ferried a work boat to Tangier Island during the summer months. And um, if anybody does not believe in sea level rise, I would invite you to take a trip to Tangier, which is about 10 miles off the Eastern shore. Environmental educators, my wife included, often point to outdoor hands-on experience as the critical link to understanding and appreciating our natural resources. That is certainly true for me. I was first motivated to run for office because of my concern for the health of the Chesapeake Bay. I have witnessed both the bounty of a clean bay and the losses of underwater grasses and living resources brought on by the onslaught of nutrient pollution. And I have made restoring the Chesapeake Bay a top priority of our administration. I'm incredibly proud of the job Virginia state agencies have done, particularly with all of the challenges presented by the ongoing pandemic. The Commonwealth has implemented a cleanup plan that ensures we will reach our goals while also taking into account the added pollution brought on by climate change. We have improved and expanded programs to help Virginia farmers reduce runoff pollution. We have also set clear expectations for reaching our goals with the agriculture industry by the 2025 deadline. Earlier this year, I signed legislation to set new regulation targets and timelines for municipal wastewater treatment facilities. Our administration has sought to prioritize actions that reduce nutrient pollution throughout its many conservation programs from land protection to coastal resilience. Just this morning, we announced additional investments to reduce pollution in the Chesapeake Bay. A billion dollars, I'll repeat that, a billion dollars with a B, the largest investment in the health of our Bay of any governor's administration. For the first time, our proposed budget fully funds our agriculture BMP cost share program something that conservation and agriculture interests have long wanted to see. Our budget also provides much needed assistance to those wastewater operators who have asked to contribute additional reductions and to local governments tackling stormwater and combined sewer overflow projects. With these investments, Virginia will live up to its clean water commitment to the citizens of the Commonwealth, our Bay Partner States, and EPA. But ultimately, Virginia cannot do it alone. EPA must serve its critical role in seeking compliance with the Clean Water Act. This Chesapeake Bay partnership must continue its collaborative approach while pushing each partner to reach for its goals. The Chesapeake Bay is a national treasure. Our work to restore it is a national example of how a partnership across governments states and political sides can come together and realize shared goals. As you know, my term as governor and as chair of the executive council are coming to an end. Your next chair will be Michael Regan, President Biden's administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency who was selected today by a unanimous vote, I will add, uh, by our council. It has been my honor to serve as chair the past year. Working together, we have taken critical steps to build equity and justice into all aspects of our restoration work and make sure that all people, not just a privileged few, 
reap the benefits of conservation efforts. So I want to thank you all. It has been a pleasure to work with people who are truly committed to the work of cleaning up our bay. And before I introduce the next speaker, I'd like to thank the team that spent the last year developing a plan to build equity and justice into our work. It was a difficult assignment and I applaud the team for taking on that challenge. We all recognize that this is just the beginning of building a just and equitable program. So our next speaker is Vernice Miller-Travis, Executive Vice President of the Metropolitan Group. Vernice is one of the nation's pioneering and most respected thought leaders on environmental justice and the interplay of civil rights and environmental policy. Bernice has vast experience as a civil rights and environmental policy analyst and advocate. She has served on the EPA National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. So please all join me in welcoming Bernice. Bernice, thank you. Thank you so much, Governor Northam. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so many points of personal privilege I'd like, I'd like to start with, but first I wanna thank you, Governor Northam, though we have not had the chance to meet in person. I had the dear privilege of working with your Director Paler of um, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality to help lead and conduct the first environmental justice study ever for Virginia DEQ that has set a new path um, for advancing environmental justice in the state of Virginia. You made those resources possible. You helped lead a legislative effort to create an Environmental Justice Act for the state uh, uh, of Virginia and the Commonwealth of Virginia. You created the political space for this work to happen. And Director Paler stepped into that space and drove that train. Um, and he said to me early on in our work together that um, he wanted to stop hearing about California being lifted up as the, um, the lodestone for all the good work done on environmental justice, and he wanted Virginia to um, step into that space, and I'll be darned if that hasn't happened. And so, Director Paler, I want to um, lift you up. I want to lift up your deputy, Chris Bass, but Governor Northam, you really um, leaned in to create this space in Virginia, and I just want to thank you so much for that work and for the privilege to serve um, Virginia DEQ in that work. I also want to set a special thank you to my own secretary, Ben Grumbles. I see you down there, Ben, um, for Maryland Department of the Environment. I served for 13 years on the Maryland Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities as its vice chair and acting chair. And last but not least, someone who I actually lectured to when he was in law school, um, Basil Zikos, who is the commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, my home state. Um, and uh, I say that to say that when I first uh, moved here, in 1998, um, shortly thereafter, I went back to New York to work at the Ford Foundation as the first program officer for environmental justice. And when I came back to Maryland in 2003, um, Scott Spencer, who was the chair of the Maryland Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities and is the deputy director of the Marguerite Casey Foundation said to me, you know, Vernice, you live in Maryland. You live in the Chesapeake Bay. You don't live in New York anymore. So you need to focus your efforts on what's going on here. And I um, took that very seriously and began to build a series of partnerships with folks across the Chesapeake Bay region, but in particular, the DMV. And why was that important to me? So even though I spent most of my life in New York before the last 23 years of living in Maryland, my grandmother made it uh, known that any time any of our relatives from Maryland came to New York, they were originally from Ellicott City, and they moved to Baltimore, they were not to cross the state lines of New York without bringing a bushel of crabs. She wanted us to know who we were and where we were from, and in order to do that, we had to have crabs at every opportunity. So, And I, I'm not sure about the crab cake. Um, battle. I'm not going to get in the middle of that. I'm just glad that I'm here. Um, so I want to share with you some of the things that have been happening. Just a year and a half ago, the Executive Council issued a statement um, 
in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice, which strengthened the partnership commitment to diversity and environmental justice established in the 2014 Watershed Agreement. The leaders present today acknowledged and emphasized that the Chesapeake Bay restoration efforts depend on the equitable, just, and inclusive engagement of all communities living throughout the watershed. To further the Executive Council statement, the partnership announced an action strategy with four pillars, provide an authorizing environment in which all these agencies, jurisdictions, organizations, and communities can work, advance DEIJ internally in the culture and operations of the organization that make up this partnership that is certainly happening at Virginia DEQ, advance DEIJ through everyday work of partners, including through funding, excuse me, through funding and advanced DEIJ by tracking and holding ourselves accountable for performance metrics. What are we doing and how do we know we're making progress? And informed by work started several years ago, this directive and action strategy brought together and helped focus so much of the hard work that has already been undertaken through the dedication of so many partners across the watershed. So I guess I was asked to give these remarks today because by some fluke, I have been in the middle of so much of this work across our region, and it really has been a fluke. But I just wanna lift up some of the great partners that have helped to bring us to this moment and laid the groundwork. Um, first and foremost, the EPA Chesapeake Bay program, particularly its past director, Nick D. Pasquale, and Jim Edwards. Um, I remember Nick um, at the first University of Maryland Environmental Justice and Health Equity Conference. I think it was shortly after the Bay Agreement was signed and included a provision around environmental justice. And, and Nick railed at us and he said, why aren't you all coming to the table to help us figure out how to lift up this agreement and make it real? And he never, ever, ever stepped away from that commitment. And even though he's retired, he still is beating that drum that we wanna make sure that our work in the Chesapeake Bay restoration is included around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I also wanna mention the Chesapeake Bay Trust, not just because I'm on their advisory board, but because before I was on their advisory board. They committed to a capacity building initiative to help Bay organizations and Chesapeake Bay watershed organizations really dig deeply around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. The first three organizations that I provided technical assistance to in that initiative were the West Virginia Rivers Coalition, Blue Water Baltimore and the South River Federation out of Annapolis. And that work has continued to grow and the circle has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Also the Potomac Riverkeeper Network, the Maryland Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities, Clean Water Actions Chesapeake Program, the EPA Office of Water Urban Waters Program, the Washington Council of, Govern of Governments, especially when Adam Ortiz was the chair and really put um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion on the front burner. The, D the DMV, and for those of you who are not down from this part of the South, this part of the South of the region as DC, Maryland, and Virginia. We think of ourselves as interconnected to each other. Um, the DMV EJ Coalition, the Virginia EJ Collaborative, the University of Maryland School of Public Health Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health, led by Dr. Sakobi Wilson, and most recently joined by all of this effort, joined by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's Chesapeake Bay Program, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Workgroup. All of these folks have been laying groundwork for a long time to get us to this moment, but without all of you, without your leadership, Governor Northam, without all of you who have been pushing this moment forward, we would not be here. Um, and now we're at this point where partners are committed to a foundation for building meaningful relationships with communities, and we enjoy strong leadership, unprecedented leadership from President Biden, from the states and governors represented here, from the federal agencies represented by EPA. I see you, Janet. So good to see you. And um, we are looking forward to the leadership of Director, uh, Administrator Mike Regan as he assumes the next chair. It's gonna be an amazing thing. And I wanna end by um, saying that um, you know you're getting old when people that you taught are the secretaries of your state agency, Basel, 
folks who are you, your colleagues are the regional administrators, and I just want to give Adam a shout out, the first regional administrator for Region 3 from Maryland, the first person of color um, to be the regional administrator for Region 3. Um, Adam, it has been a pleasure being your partner, your colleague, um, and watching you from the mayor um, all the way through secretaries of the environment and the things that you've done. This is our time. And uh, this is our moment. And thank you all for letting us get to this place, for being so supportive, for directing the resources, and for putting your shoulder to the wheel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vernice, for, um, for joining us today and, and really highlighting a, a, a big um, accomplishment of the partnership this, this past year. My name is Michelle Price Fay. I'm the Acting Director of the Chesapeake Bay Program Office. Um, and I think Vernice just shows how important it is um, that we really think about diversity, equity, and inclusion across our partnership and throughout our leadership. So thank you for your, for your wonderful remarks. Uh, I'm here to give an overview of the state of the Chesapeake Bay Program. Um, and really present some of the highlights because it's all about our partnership and what we accomplished together. And this year's report is, has a more holistic view of those accomplishments. You will read about the Chesapeake Farms Initiative, which is supported by many of our partners uh, here today. You will also see the highlight that the local government advisory uh, committee did this year on a virtual forum to support um, many of our municipalities as they think about funding that, that they have available to them to, to be able to do co-benefits and, and advance water quality projects throughout our watershed. Over 300 participants were part of that virtual meeting. Um, I think it's the first of many where we can try to support our local communities as we think about how do we take this influx of funding that's unprecedented and available to us and really roll our sleeves up and figure out how we're gonna to continue to implement those projects in support of watershed, the watershed agreement outcomes. Uh, we also highlighted our science and technical advisory committee publications in the state of the program. Uh, science is what we base our decision making on and it is a cornerstone to the partnership as a whole. It is where our policies come from. So we are really grateful for the work uh, that the Science and Technical Advisory Committee do, as well as how our Citizens Advisory Committee provide guidance to the Executive Council, the pr Principal Staff Committee, and the Management Board throughout the partnership. But the state of the program goes beyond just those outcomes that we've highlighted over this past year. There was a really concerted effort to look at all of the outcomes in the 2014 agreement, see where we're making progress, where additional work needs to be made, and the state of the program has an overview dashboard that talks about where are we? Because we need to know where we are to figure out where we're going and where we need to focus our attention in the future. And over the next year, there are a couple of key areas where we will be focusing our efforts on forest buffers and wetlands to really help advance the water quality goals um, that we're all working towards to get to 2025. There are some great successes. We have 12 outcomes where we've done a lot of great work. Um, there's been some concerted effort, and one that we can highlight for sure is restor restoring oyster reefs in 10 tributaries in the bay. And it is the largest restoration in the world. And there's an overachievement as well, as Virginia has committed to an 11th project. So it's never, too, never a bad thing to overachieve um, as we set our targets. We're on course to protecting 2 million acres of land and working with schools across the watershed to ensure they have environmental literacy programs in place. And that's even in the wake of a pandemic where our, our teams have worked in virtual environments to, to advance environmental literacy. And none of those successes would be possible without the core foundation of this organization, which is the partnership. The partnership is a superpower. There are so many people who come together, focus their energy and efforts, and really advance those goals to protect and restore the, the local waters in the Chesapeake Bay. It's not all good news. There have been some declines over the past year, and that is part of our, our public transparency. Those declines are in underwater grasses. There was a drop in overall water quality standards and attainment, and we're really seriously looking at blue crab populations. While we're making, we're making strides and we're meeting benchmarks now, we need to be really mindful of that information and think about what that population look like in, looks like in the future. And we need to understand the variables that impact that. Climate change certainly is, is something that we have to be mindful of. We have to create the science behind. That's what we're really good at, science and forward thinking. How do we use those tools and how do we consider that in our conversations going forward? Of course, great successes, great highlights this year include the diversity, equity, inclusion implementation strategy, as well as the climate change directive that Governor Northam 
uh, mentioned earlier, we have a clear direction that those are important pieces of our work moving forward. So we greet this new year with a renewed sense of focus. Uh, we need to work together to prepare for more res resilient watershed. And as we tackle the increasing threats of climate change, the program is strong because of the partners who come together at the table at all levels to problem solve and celebrate success. And we are stronger when we work together. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chairman Bolova to provide remarks. Thank you so much, um, and good afternoon, everybody. It is wonderful to be here with you. A little piece of trivia, um, uh, kind of going back in memory lane, when I first ran for office in 2006, uh, the General Assembly building was, um, or actually the state capitol was under renovation. Um, and so this was actually the house chambers uh, when I first entered into public service as a freshman back in 2006. And my seat was over there where those tables are now. So anyways, uh, you are, uh, in some respects, in the historic capital of Virginia, um, <laughs> at least for two years. Uh, but I had wanted to uh, just first, first start off by saying thank you again to, to Governor Northam, uh, not only for graciously hosting us at this event today, but I think more importantly for your uh, steadfast leadership to uh, restore and protect the Chesapeake Bay and its watersheds, right? I think the thing that ties us all together is not just the Chesapeake Bay, but a healthy Chesapeake Bay is reliant on all those watersheds that stretch the entire 64,000 square mile area that drains to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and that leadership certainly um, includes the, the year that you've been here as the chair on the executive council, and we've continued to make um, great progress towards meeting our Chesapeake Bay restoration targets. And in fact, we've accelerated that progress. Um, and so that's really exciting. But what I'm most grateful for is having a governor who understands the relationship among our people and our economy and our environment and how all interconnected those three things really, really are. And so I'm very proud of what we've achieved as fellow Virginians um, and particularly grateful that your outgoing budget reflects those priorities. Um, and so we promise that we're gonna do everything we possibly can uh, to go ahead and make sure that those uh, that budget uh, gets across the finish line. It's really, really important. Um, I also wanna just extend my gratitude to each of my fellow executive council members um, and their staffs and also the commission members and, uh, and our staff uh, for all that we've accomplished over this, this last year, and I'm looking at you, Anne. Um, for every meeting like this, uh, for every accomplishment that we get to take credit for, I know that there is hundreds of people who have spent thousands of hours uh, working to go ahead and make those a reality. And so a heartfelt thank you uh, for all those people who are working so hard to go ahead and do that. And then finally, uh, let me just go ahead and extend my gratitude to everybody um, who is with us today, whether you're on the executive council or not. Um, the beauty and the strength of the Chesapeake Bay partnership is that it extends well beyond our formal structure. And that is really, really, truly our, our strength and, and our power. Um, today, I have the privilege of joining you uh, as both a member of the Virginia House of Delegates, representing Fairfax County and uh, the city of Fairfax, as well as uh, the chair of the Chesapeake Bay Commission for this year. So my term is also ending this year, uh, along with uh, Governor Northam. Um, the commission is the only member of the executive council that represents the legislative branch of, of government. Um, and so uh, we've been a member of the executive council since the very, very beginning. And one of the most important roles of our 21 member commission is to serve as emissaries uh, back to our respective legislative bodies. And so we are in a really unique position to dive into the science of Bay restoration. Not all of our colleagues have uh, that ability or the time to be able to do that. And so we've got a very special responsibility to take that information that we've synthesized and then bring that knowledge back to our fellow legislators so that we can take action um, and make the case for action. I think every legislator knows that this collaborative approach is essential. Um, as much as I've tried, I've discovered that no single legislator can actually pass a law on their own. Um, it's only through collective action uh, that we're able to make that change. And so similarly, we do not and we cannot make progress on Chesapeake Bay restoration without collective action across the breadth and diversity of our 64,000 square mile watershed. And with that in mind, we have a duty to ensure that diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice are addressed in all of our work. 
Last January, uh, the commission met with the bill sponsors of New Jersey's landmark environmental justice legislation. I think one of the great things that we have is with 50 states in the District of Columbia, um, is that we have lots of great models out there uh, for the work that we want to, want to go ahead and accomplish. And so the bill that they enacted in August of 2020 increases reviews of projects and communities with significant minority, low income, and ESL households. In other words, before permits can be issued, impacts to these communities must be considered. Meeting with Senator Singleton and Assembly McKeon and the stakeholders who backed them, the commission really sought to understand what it took to go ahead and create a legislatively fertile landscape that allowed that bill to occur. This year, and this is the great thing about being a Virginia legislator and chair of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, is that we get to take credit for all the good work in our tri-state area. Um, but hats off to our Maryland delegation because they were particularly successful moving ahead with these reforms based on these discussions uh, within the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Um, they addressed environmental justice concerns through three pieces of significant legislation that were passed during the 2021 General Assembly session. First, Commission members Sarah Elfrith, uh, Senator Sarah Elfrith and Delegate Tony Bridges sponsored legislation to enhance the duties, functions, and membership of Maryland's Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities by including required annual community listening sessions and an assessment of current state and local laws to address the issues of environmental justice. Second, amendments to Maryland's Clean Water Commerce Act, again sponsored by Commission members uh, Senator Guy Gazzoni and Delegate Dana Stein not only increased funding for this program from $10 million to $20 million, but now requires that 20% of the funding goes to green infrastructure projects in communities disproportionately burdened by environmental harms and risks. And then finally, Maryland commissioners played a significant role in passing the Tree Solutions Act, which in part requires the state to plant 500,000 trees in underserved areas by 2031. These conversations have been replicated across Virginia and Pennsylvania, uh, where we've had um, ongoing uh, exploration of the nexus between clean water, vibrant communities, recreational access, and more. Climate change resilience is a particularly powerful example of a po policy area that must be considered in the context of empowering vulnerable communities. In Virginia, for example, we created a new community flood preparedness fund. And that fund this year has to have at least 25% of that funding going towards economically disadvantaged geographic areas. Just as the Bay Partnership has pledged to reaffirm our commitment to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, the commission pledges, again, to look for opportunities to ensure that these goals are reflected in our laws and our budgets. I wanna wrap up by just giving a special thanks to all the citizens of the watershed uh, whose individuals action, individual actions will ultimately create our success. And now I would like to turn the microphone over to Sean Garvin, Secretary of the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Bolivar. It's uh, really great to see you. Um, Governor Northam, thank you very much for not only your leadership, but your hospitality. I'm not gonna get into the whole crab cake thing, but the pumpkin Chesapeake, uh, the cheesecake was outstanding, and I'm not sure if Marilyn can, can match that. So um, to uh, Deputy Administrator McCabe, uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today and to be able to work with you again, and I look forward to our work in our future. Uh, to the Regional Administrator, Adam Ortiz, welcome. I look forward to working with you again as well. Uh, to all the secretaries and, and directors who uh, are on the dais here uh, today, uh, thank you for your incredible work and efforts uh, every day. Uh, to Ann Jennings, Secretary Jennings, um, and to, I want to recognize also Matt Strickler uh, for his leadership over the last year, the PSC, and uh, the amazing work uh, he did, and to our advisory committees and, and the tremendous um, focus and work and guidance that you guys provide us every day. But particularly today, uh, thank you very much for that. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Governor John Carney who sends his regards and his regrets. Delaware continues to focus on improving water quality, meeting our WIP milestones, and supporting the goals of the Watershed Agreement. All Delaware families deserve access to clean water, which also supports our agriculture and tourism economy. As the lowest lying state in the nation, we are particularly focused on climate change. 
Governor Carney recently announced the adoption of De Delaware's Climate Action Plan. The plan will help Delaware meet our greenhouse gas emissions reductions and maximize our resiliency to climate change. It's a living document is meant to be provide a guidance to programs and policies moving forward. Delaware's Climate Action Plan is the culmination of a two year long effort that included input from experts, state agencies, stakeholders, community groups, and residents throughout the state. The plan builds on decades of foundational efforts and current best available science to show the impacts of climate change on Delaware and the threats we face if we fail to act. Strong partnerships are essential to ensuring equity in climate action and water quality efforts. They also help increase awareness about some of our existing programs that help businesses and individuals. An important guiding principle of Delaware's Climate Action Plan is to ensure that climate action is engaged, empowering, and equitable. Equity starts with sharing, ensuring everyone has a seat at the table and that all concerns are heard. We're applying this principle to the way the department operates, focusing on serving underserved and overburdened communities as part of our DNA and not just an activity we do between doing our regular jobs. Our efforts and the efforts of the Chesapeake Bay partnership we are discussing here today are very complimentary. On behalf of Governor Carney, we continue to pledge our commitment to the partnership and look forward to the future holds. At this time, it's my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Director Tommy Wells from the District of Columbia. Thank you, Secretary Garvin, and thank you for your leadership and partnership over the years when you were regional administrator as well, and we greatly appreciate that. Let me say, Governor Northam, on behalf of our Mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser, how much we appreciate your leadership and what you've done in your track record to bring this organization forward on behalf of our region. The, um, the issues of diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice is extremely important to the mayor. And we know that um, the disproportionate impact when our, our soil or our earth, our, our water, and our, and our air is not clean, it has a disproportionate impact on parts of our of our, of our residents that are particularly vulnerable around environmental justice. Additionally, the importance to be sure that the grants that we do, the, um, the people that we hire reflects the um, diversity, but also the, the ability to, um, to bring people into the opportunities that, that we can now bring forward. I also want to acknowledge, and would be remiss not to acknowledge, the work that um, the First Lady of Virginia did with you that um, your wife Pam has strong values of environment, teaching children, and so do you, and that has been a model for us and greatly appreciated and certainly a signature to your leadership. So we have a lot of work to do and we've made a lot of accomplishments. We've essentially in partnership, and the only way we can do this is in partnership, essentially restored the shad to the Potomac River. We're seeing sturgeon come up as far as Washington, D.C. We do see that when we do our part, the nature starts doing her or his part as well. And now we have um, really the, the time that Ms. Um, Miller Travis talked about is that this is our time, this is our moment. And I'm so thrilled that our EPA Administrator Regan with his amazing team has agreed to provide leadership at a national level on one of the most important water bodies in the world. And with the investment that our president is making and the capacity that we're building together, which will join together in partnership, that we'll begin to see really the, the benefits and the payoff of all of this working together as we do our part and nature does their part. So I'm very excited, but also appreciative of the work that everyone has done to get us this far. Thank you. And now I will introduce my partner, my neighbor, my mentor, my good friend, Ben Grumbles. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, it's always hard to follow you, which is why I often try not to. Um, but I, uh, Governor, Governor, on behalf of Governor Larry Hogan, I would like to request six minutes to rebut the crab cake trash talk. Um, Listen, I just for the public, I, th this is so important and this is so timely to be getting together to focus on all the work and progress we need to make in 2022. And so Maryland is very, very pleased with 
um, the, um, the election of the chair of the executive council administrator, Michael Regan, and his strong team with the deputy administrator McCabe and regional administrator Adam Ortiz. But we have very important work to do. And I would just say that this is December 15th. Uh, why can't we, by January 15th, have a very strong agreement to get out of the litigation chapter and make real progress? Accountability, funding, continued bipartisan, science-based environmental leadership. It's, it's needed more than ever, and so uh, hopefully the stars are aligning for that. And we're appreciative of that. And Maryland is also appreciative of the fact that uh, under your leadership, Governor, with your strong, strong team over the last couple of years, we've really focused in on, as well when Governor Hogan was the chair of the EC, on meeting our water quality related goals, but also putting much greater emphasis on climate change and on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and continuing to do that. And so I would just emphasize that um, we have uh, a lot of work to do on both of those challenges, as well as the, that third area of uh, that very important interstate river, the Susquehanna, and the Conowingo Dam impacts of that, holding the dam owner accountable. But the two other areas which we're very focused on with uh, leadership of the federal government and the other states is moving forward on the Conowingo watershed implementation plan. So with the new federal funding and federal leadership interstate uh, collaboration, that's going to be very important. And I would just cl close by simply saying that Maryland, Marylanders demand excellence uh, and, and are united uh, for leadership on the Chesapeake Bay, science-based, innovative progress working closely with the local governments and all of our partners and we're just very pleased to be part of this very important effort thank you very much and now is it my honor to be able to introduce well this is a true honor to be able to pass the microphone over to uh, our nation's very own Deputy Administrator of EPA, Janet McCabe, who has tremendous background in the, oh, oh, to New York. And then after turning it to uh, Still a huge Deputy honor. Administrator, yeah. I was just following the line, and, uh, but um bump uh, We have crab cakes too, okay. And, <laughs> And someone who uh, also interned for Chesapeake Bay Foundation <laughs> at one point in time and who is a great partner and friend right. to the north, Basil Segos. Thank you, Ben, New for York. that wonderful introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, better known as the former intern of uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and super fan of Vernice Miller, uh, Basil Segos from, from New York, uh, Representing Governor Hochul. Governor, thank you for convening us here today. Thank you for your incredible work over the last year. You've done uh, um, an amazing job convening us and really c cementing some of these principles that we've talked about today, environmental justice, of course, uh, respect for climate change, and, and focusing us on investments coming uh, to the direction of, of this very beautiful and important watershed. Uh, Deputy Administrator McCabe, we look forward to working with you uh, and Administrator Regan. Uh, on, on President Biden's amazing commitment to uh, the watershed, $238 million uh, is, a, is a game changer uh, for, for all of us as we look to make these really important investments in, in the watershed. So thank you. Um, New York is absolutely committed to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We are only 10% uh, of, of the total watershed and 4% of its population, but we take it very seriously. Uh, we've 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 made great strides over the last uh, really 20 years on reducing uh, contamination uh, flowing into the watershed. Uh, big reductions, six million pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus that we've we've dropped down uh, that enters into through the Susquehanna into uh, into the watershed. Um, but we know we have work to do still, and we know that this uh, the TMDL that we have in place right now 
uh, plus the federal dollars and of course state dollars uh, will, will give us the chance to make these really uh, incredible investments both in our people and in our in our in our watershed quality. Um, so we've gone we've, we've gone big on environmental spending in New York uh, since I started about six years ago. We've we've uh, put four billion dollars into clean water infrastructure. Um, and that's both the drinking water side and the wastewater side, and uh, about a billion dollars a year in SRF funding, which is, I think, the largest SRF program in the country. So we are grateful for uh, the president's continued support for the SRF program and, and really uh, making that a top priority of, of the administration. Uh, we just put out $272 million of announcements uh, last week. Uh, for water infrastructure, about uh, 25 million of that will go into the watershed itself, as well as another uh, $4 million for farms in the watershed in order, in order to keep our farms sustainable and strong and also more respectful of, of the environment. Um, we have about a $300 million a year commitment to, uh, to the environment in New York through a grant program called the Environmental Protection Fund, which has been very successful and is used for capacity building. So we talked a bit about capacity building earlier today. How do we, uh, how do we boost up smaller groups, municipalities, so that they can take advantage of larger grant programs? We intend to use the Environmental Protection Fund to do some of that very important capacity building work. And then in 2022, uh, we have a great opportunity to uh, further increase our funding and our com funding commitment to the watershed here through a, a bond act, a $4 billion bond act that the governor has put forward as part of her upcoming budget and will go in front of the voters in, in the fall. Uh, it would be a great chance for us to, to uh, make some, some legacy investments in our, in our outdoors. Um, and of course, New York has also gone big also on, on DEIJ principles. Um, I'm so thrilled that uh, the governor, you've, you've taken this mantle and really run with it over the last year. Uh, we are doing the same. Uh, we started uh, what we believe is, is one of the stronger uh, climate laws in the country. Uh, where we commit ourselves to net zero by 2050, but one of the, the 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 really the hallmark of that law is the embracing of DEIJ principles, and 40% of the investments through our law will go into DEIJ investments, um, and and that will help to change really the uh, the look and feel of our state, but more importantly the opportunities and the health of our most disadvantaged communities. Um, so uh, listen, this, this, this year is going to be an important one. I agree with you, Ben. Uh, this is an op opportunity right now, 2022, to, uh, to, to put old grievances aside and for us to really prioritize uh, not just the uh, investments we make, but the way in which we solidify some of these, these permanent agreements that we're all uh, fortunate to have here in the watershed. And I just couldn't be more thrilled that the administrator is going to be taking up the mantle of leading this body and has a chance to uh, to help to cement some long-term investments for, for our future and also just to make sure that we are all um, bearing our share of, of, the, of the cleanup of, of this beautiful resource. So again, Governor, thank you. Thank you on behalf of our governor from New York and we're just thrilled to be back with you today. Thank you. And now, <laughs> it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce my immediate neighbor to the south, uh, the Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Redding. Mr. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, Governor, thank you. Thanks for always being a, a gracious host. Uh, uh, when we were in uh, Virginia Beach, and uh, I, I recall the, the tour of the Brock Center and the passion of the First Lady. Uh, I really appreciated her perspective and, and history there, uh, which I did not know prior. I really appreciated uh, that uh, presentation. So thank you for being a great host and public service on behalf of Governor Wolf. Uh, thank you for all you've done and do. Uh, to uh, the Executive uh, Council, welcome all and thank you. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, there are a number of uh, environmental items that uh, are top of mind, but certainly uh, we are pleased with the progress uh, in the watershed implementation plan. Uh, we've seen success, uh, as has been noted several times here today, uh, in the collective approach and particularly appreciative of what counties have done through the work of the county action plans. Uh, for Pennsylvania, uh, water quality strategy to succeed, uh, we're focused on the local water quality uh, as our primary concern. And of course, we know <clears throat> that the local uh, quality improvements directly translate to meeting the Bay TMDL uh, requirements. Uh, we were pleased with the recent uh, news from USGS uh, 
um, that they reported the Chesapeake Bay's three largest rivers all show uh, long-term reductions in nutrient uh, pollution. And specifically, uh, the Susquehanna River has uh, continued to show sustained improvements in nitrogen and phosphorus levels since uh, data collection began in 1985. Uh, we're encouraged uh, as well by this progress and recognize the work of programs and the best management practices in place in order to reach this achievement. Uh, it is a step in the right direction and we are committed to ensuring the farmers and producers uh, have access to resources to implement and strengthen uh, best management practices on the ground. You know, part of our commitment um, uh, to the WIP3 uh, is investing in projects for accelerated implementation. Um, Chesapeake Bay Office funds have made significant investments in this regard, uh, more than $35 million over the last year. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that the Pennsylvania Farm Bill championed by Governor Wolf um, uh, includes conservation excellence grants that also uh, have allocated funds directly to uh, and, and in excess of $6 million over the last uh, several years, but particularly in the Tier 1 counties, if we call them Lancaster and York, uh, and the Tier 2 counties. Uh, to keep this momentum, however, uh, additional and significant and predictable funding sources are key. Uh, in August, the uh, Department of Agriculture, PA Department of Agriculture, work with Chesapeake Bay Commission uh, and the Agricultural Secretaries in West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New York to explore um, uh, support from the USDA to create the Chesapeake Bay Resilient Farms Initiative that the chairman uh, spoke uh, at the last uh, executive council meeting about. Uh, this is a, an initiative that would invest $737 million uh, to support the efforts of the agricultural industry over the next decade, uh, with the agricultural industry uh, responsible for 80 percent of the nitrogen reductions. Uh, this program is critical and necessary. Uh, to um, for the region to meet meet the targets. Uh, many of you have heard me say before, but the agri from an agricultural perspective, there are two co-equal goals. Uh, first is clean water, uh, and the other is viable farms. And we won't get the first without the second. They are the co-benefits. Uh, the agricultural community uh, has high standards for conservation and very deep roots in the culture of stewardship. Uh, from a personal standpoint and having a farm in Pennsylvania, I can tell you the landscape is transformed with the no-till, the buffers, the grasslands, uh, the cover crops, all of that tells me that the farms uh, are doing the right thing. We just need to get all of them to do the right thing. Uh, but a note of thanks, we could not do this without the support of uh, partners, Chesapeake Bay Commission, uh, the State Conservation Commission, the U USDA and NRCS, uh, without our, our Chesapeake Bay partners in so many ways. So just a note of thanks to the conservation districts and frontline folks who are out there every day uh, putting these practices on the ground, right? That's, that's the key to success. Uh, as we know, we, we have more to do, uh, and we must um, make sure that we, we, do, uh, we do it right uh, and we minimize uh, the impacts on local water. Like many things in life, however, uh, there is tension between the aspirational and the practical. Uh, we must consider the practical side of things, viewing the rainfall, the drought, the climate changes, the planting seasons. Uh, all of that impacts the water quality. There are a lot of variables to consider, uh, and sometimes this uh, uh, can create tension, but I think it's a healthy tension. It is a debate that we should have, a discussion we should, should be engaged in. Uh, and with the current discussions of climate, climate change, climate management, I would say for those in Chesapeake Bay who have a 30-year head start of understanding the benefits of the environment and the impacts on uh, the quality of life in, in our community, but also in the landscape. Uh, so uh, we'll take a long view. We'll stay at it. We thank you very much for the partnership and appreciate the leadership from uh, the governor, from, from you and, and uh, the executive council. So uh, privileged to uh, introduce now Deputy Secretary uh, Mandarola uh, from West Virginia. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, um, I'm very thankful to be here today to represent West Virginia on behalf of Governor Jim Justice. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Governor Northam uh, for his hospitality and his leadership as the chair of the EC committee for the last year. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank all the Bay partners and staff for their hard work. West Virginia is committed to continuing to do our part, implementing the Chesapeake Bay TMDL to reduce nutrients, 
to improve the lives of those who live and work in West Virginia's Potomac drainage and to strength, strengthen our commitment to diversity and environmental justice. West Virginia is developing our plan to reach out and deliver our Chesapeake Bay programs to underserved minority and low income communities. We anticipate offering small grant opportunities with flexible ma match obligations to begin to work with non-traditional partners. We have several small projects underway involving tree planting repair and riparian areas. These projects not only benefit the Bay with nutrient reductions, but also benefit local West Virginia communities. We have worked with college students at Shepherd University who have used EPA's environmental justice screening tool to help us identify project opportunities and those same students will help with project implementation. West Virginia's primary focus is water quality and implementation of the TMDL by 2025. West Virginia's current watershed implementation plan is designed to address additional nutrient loads predicted from climate change. But we also recognize it may take opportunities provided by other Bay priorities, such as public access to bring in new DEIJ partnerships. We look forward to these new opportunities for engagement and growing our programs. Thank you. All right, so I'm back up here to do what uh, Secretary Grumbles tried to steal from me. Yeah. Uh, I have the op same old, same old. I have the opportunity uh, to introduce our last speaker for the program, a incredibly impressive woman. Uh, here representing EPA Administrator Michael Regan, we have Janet McCabe, who was sworn in uh, by President Biden to serve as the 16th Deputy Administrator of EPA uh, last April. Janet McCabe returns to EPA, having served there for President Biden uh, previously as an acting assistant administrator and a principal deputy to the assistant administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation. The gap in between, uh, Mrs. McCabe was serving as the professor of practice at Indiana University McKinney School of Law and serving as the director of the Indiana University Environmental Resilient Institute. Uh, she hails from Washington, D.C., uh, and graduated from Harvard College as well as Harvard Law School. Uh, please join me in welcoming Janet McCabe. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Governor, for having us all here today and for your leadership over the, the last couple of years. Um, and I'm, I know it will continue in the future in, in one way or another. Um, uh, I, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, as you said, I, I was born in the district, uh, grew up in uh, D.C. and Maryland. Um, so this is sort of my hood, although I've lived for the last uh, 30 years now in the Midwest, um, in, in Indiana. And if you haven't had Indiana crab cakes, you have not lived. Um, so anytime you're welcome to, to come out 70, I-70, and we'll get you some crab cakes. Um, this is an incredibly exciting time uh, for all of us. It's an exciting time for this new administration, the Biden-Harris administration. Administrator Regan, um, who is absolutely thrilled to be asked um, to, to um, step up as the leader of this um, uh, executive council. Um, and we're, we're, um, we take this very seriously and uh, eager, eager to move forward. Um, I want to thank our new regional administrator, Adam Ortiz, for his uh, leadership and in stepping into this opportunity. And it's actually been thrilling for me to hear all of you people who know Adam say all these nice things about him because I was part of the you know, selection committee, and I'm, I think we did okay. Um, so, so, so that's that's great. Um, I, I know from my my own history here, but even more from hearing all of you, how critically important the Chesapeake Bay is to this part of the country, um, and uh, and all the people who live um, near and far within the reach of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, it's amazing to hear about how people have been working together um, and all the progress that's been made, but, but even more the commitment to continue to address and tackle these issues. And if I could just um, share um, an example from, from the Midwestern part of my life, um, it took the state of Wisconsin suing the state of Illinois 
for the states around Lake Michigan to come together to figure out how to solve the ozone problem. And we did that together. And there's now a group of those states that continue to work on air quality issues in the Midwest. And likewise, there are uh, groups um, who are just as focused on the Great Lakes, the treasure of the Midwest, just as the Chesapeake Bay is here. So, so I may not have worked on the Chesapeake Bay issues, uh, but I have worked in state federal collaborative um, uh, uh, arrangements that is the only way to get things done, um, including not just the state governments, but the local governments, the community groups, um, uh, the citizen groups, the, the uh, academic institutions, the businesses, uh, the farms, um, all of the people that make up those economies and, and those communities around there. So I am so proud to hear all the conversation about the commitment to uh, the, um, the Partnerships Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice Action Strategy Implementation Plan. Um, if you've heard any one word from Administrator Regan, you probably have heard the word environmental justice. That's two words, actually. Um, uh, in, in, uh, there is, I, I thought we were focused on environmental justice during the Obama administration, and we were, believe me. Um, but uh, President Biden and Administrator Regan are taking that to a whole new level. Um, and uh, as I said at our, at our lunch today, um, it's, it's one thing for us to say those things. It's another to be out in the community and hear others who have the ability to actually make it happen on the ground saying those very same things. Um, likewise, the commitment to climate change and kudos to all of you um, for the commitment to climate change directive um, and focused on those issues. Because if we, if we tackle climate change, which we must, we must, we will also be doing so much good in the here and now for pollution in our communities. It's affecting people today. So thank you to Vernice for uh, sharing her comments about the progress that we're making. And also as always, as always Vernice challenging us to not forget what we're about here um, and that we need to keep doing it. So um, we very much continue, um, uh, look forward to continuing uh, not just the conversations, but the actual work on the ground, working with all our partners around the table to meet the goals that everybody has outlined in the plan um, and recognizing that um, indeed we have not met them all. Um, isn't that the way life is? Um, and uh, yet progress is made incremental by incremental and we re-examine our goals and we keep setting them so that perhaps we won't meet them because if we set them where we'll meet them, that's we're probably not um, uh, being um, aggressive enough. Um, we need to do all of this so that we are delivering clean water, clean air, clean land, a clean future to everybody in the Chesapeake Bay community, regardless of their zip code, the color of their skin, how much money they make, um, or where they live. Um, that is our responsibility. And we won't get there without partnership and without collaboration. And it's important to thank and recognize all of the little actions every day that build up to success and a sense of accomplishment. I think it's been a decade since EPA last had the honor and privilege of uh, leading the partnership. So we know that we have, um, we have, uh, 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 um, big shoes to fill. I was looking for the right metaphor, trying to think of something having to do with crabs, but um, big, big shoes to fill. Um, and uh, and we're, we're certainly uh, pre prepared to do that. Um, I think I sort of got ahead of myself here as I often do. Um, I just want to close by, um, by acknowledging as others have the unprecedented moment we have here in history to advance our efforts. The funding that is coming through the bipartisan infrastructure law and when it is passed, um, Build Back Better is unbelievable. It is um, more than once in a generation an opportunity for us to really change the way this country looks, to change um, who is served by the resources um, provided by this country and for us to do it together. Um, EPA has huge responsibilities under the bipartisan in infrastructure law. We are um, racing to be ready to um, make sure that those funds get to where they're supposed to go, where Congress and the president want them to go. Um, and as I said at the lunch, we need your help in making sure that we know how to do that well. And um, this is our moment to show that government can work. 
uh, to get these funds out the door. So we are certainly committed to doing that. Um, uh, we know that there's um, money directly coming to this program, yay, right? Um, uh, and also um, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, the vast bulk of the money is going to the Office of Water um, for, uh, for water-related projects. So Chesapeake Bay, get in line um, because, uh, you, because you're included. So thank you all so very much. Um, we look forward to um, uh, leading, but mostly working with you all um, in the coming years. Um, and, uh, and once again, thank you, uh, Governor Northam, for your leadership. I think I have the pleasure of, of uh, can I do this now? Um, uh, present you with a, 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 a thank you gift for, for, for your leadership. Um, it's, it turns out that uh, what brings everybody together is oysters. Yes, Tur tur turns out, so, um, so on behalf of, uh, uh, of all of us at EPA, to thank you for your leadership. Um, uh, that is thank a you. small token that uh, is reminiscent of oysters. Um, and I think that you can take as part of your legacy, um, making the Chesapeake Bay a great place for oysters once again. Thank you, and uh, you have beat me to the punch. So I, I, I have a, a, just a small token of our appreciation. First of all, this gavel. Uh, oh, so thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, it's such an early. <laughs> it's my first gavel. Yeah. Um, but yes, in addition to having the best blue crabs uh, uh -huh. in the country in Virginia, we also had the best oysters too. So we have a Virginia is for lovers oyster shucking knife oh. and a tray, so that you will be able to enjoy oysters as well. So All thank right, you thank you so much, Governor. Thank you. All right, do I get to close this down? We are adjourned, are we adjourned? About one minute, I just oh. wanna invite, we do have some media that are on our webcast joining us today. If you have any questions, we'll pause for a minute. Please feel free to type it in the Q&A box and we can take some questions. All right, I don't think we have any questions coming in, so that means everybody is doing a phenomenal job. Thank you so much.